Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, the Ottawa Curling Club. So if you hear any ambient curling noise, it's because we are right outside the ice for the Monday Ladder Open League and uh, getting ready to play later tonight as uh, some folks are on the ice now. So that's the ambient noise that you hear. You might hear some noise from the lounge as well as a a bunch of teachers are getting drunk on a Monday afternoon um, as being very responsible adults (laughs) as they are. Uh, But we're doing this at the Ottawa Curling Club because the Olympics are now over. The Paralympics ended this weekend. Canada had a record-breaking haul, just as they had a record-breaking haul during the Olympic Games uh, over in Pyeongchang, South Korea. So we wanted to take this opportunity to talk about sports and the meaning of sports in these international events and whether or not we can actually derive any national identity or meaning from these sports. So I'm here with my big brother, but also my co-host on the Game of Stones podcast, Scott Graham. Hi, Scott. Hey, Sean. It's uh, terrific to be here. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Why are you talking like you're on NPR? <laughs> I was honestly thinking of that Parks and Rec episode where they have the fake <laughs> NPR guy, and I thought I could try to do his voice, but... Uh. It was close. It was close. So, uh, if anyone doesn't know, Scott and I do this podcast, Game of Stones. It's, it's just about curling. And... We started just before the uh, Scotties Tournament of Hearts. Yeah, in February. In February. And what we've been doing is talking about the games, the teams, and all this stuff. But one of the things that that we've talked about a little bit, and uh, this came up at the Continental Cup as well, is what curling means right, to the culture and and whether or not it's important. So I want to take that and just blow it out a little bit with the Olympics being over because what we see a lot at the Olympics, and this isn't exclusive to Canada, uh, but the CBC is big on this, mm-hmm. is saying that these people in the wearing the Maple Leaf, they represent who we are and what we are, uh, and, and there's so much talk about identity and who, who this country is based on the Olympics. And, and I just want to talk about whether or not we can actually take anything away from that or if it's all manufactured nationalism designed to sell us gas and coke um, and all the other stuff that they <laughs> mm-hmm. that they advertise so I certainly have my thoughts but Scott what do, what do you think about the idea of, of, of manufacturing nationalism through these type of sports well when I think about it uh, and what springs to mind uh, right away is the Vancouver 2010 Olympics uh, which I had, I had the uh, chance to go to uh, quite a few of the events uh, there and maybe it felt manufactured but I don't think the spirit of the people that were there celebrating was something that some corporate entity imagined and wanted to put. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of Hudson Bay gear, but, (laughs) but it was just sort of the community that's, that came together surrounding that. I saw people who had never before seen a cross country skiing, you know, event, just cheering their lungs out for all the, all the skiers, right? Uh, and at the curling event, people were cheering, cheering I love curling and really <laughs> loving those Norwegian pants. So what it did for Canada, in my mind, is it, it sort of provided a rallying point for the culture. Mm-hmm. And I think Olympics tend to do that no matter where they are, um, because, because when you have like some sort of cultural identity without something to rally around, it can just sort of be diffuse. You know what I mean? Okay, but I think a counter to that is there's an ephemeral quality to it. Is that, I mean, we're, what, a month away, for, a month out from the Olympics, mm-hmm. and I, I honestly couldn't tell you the actual number of medals that Canada won, and the, the actual specific number. I know it was a record, but I also know they added a bunch of new sports, so sure. of course it was a record. And, you know, a lot of the names of people I, I sort of get lost uh, and, and get forgotten a little bit. Um, you know, some of them have come up because they've since won world championships. I, mm-hmm. I can think of uh, Ted Jan Blomen. I think he won the world championship this weekend or, or last week. So, and he won a gold medal. I think he won two medals overall. But, I mean, so, so they come up here and there. But for the most part, I, I think the short track speed skaters are a great example of this, um, of Marianne St. Gelais. Um, like, she's somebody who was in Vancouver and won, and then she did well in Sochi, and then she was there again this year. 
and people are like, oh, she's this great, well, she obviously is a great athlete, but they don't really get attention outside of that. And it's almost to me like they get used by the CBC, by the companies that are promoting them when it's convenient to them, right? Like they don't get promoted off cycle mm-hmm. really that, that hard. I mean, the CBC does show some amateur sports um, during the, the year, but certainly it's not to the same extent it is. It doesn't get the same attention that it, it does during the Olympics. So I, that's why I, I wonder about the authenticity of that excitement. Because right? these people are still wearing the Maple Leaf at a world championship event uh, on whatever circuits they're on. But we don't give it this... Like, if we were truly nationalistic and really proud of these people um, in, in a way of like, oh, they're the best of us and, and we rally behind them, we would do it through the four years. We wouldn't wait until there's rings there well well sean i understand what you mean but if you think about a sport like hockey we are nationalistic about it all the time and then at the olympics the the men's hockey is the biggest event at the olympics it's the highest ticket price it has the most eyeballs on it which it was but even this year it, it was still the highest ticket price in in korea and so you know just because we don't do it for the speed skaters and the skiers and and whatnot. I don't or think the it's, women hockey players, they but, don't they don't get that much attention. But it's also because they don't play as much. I mean, they have there, there's a women's league in this country that doesn't get that much attention. They they play the Americans. They were the four is it the four continents or the four nations cup? There's four countries. The four okay. the four good countries in women's hockey. Mm. They play a tournament every year. There's the world championship that they play that does get some attention um but that but that's why i wonder like if if we're saying that well hockey is is, if we're going to use that as a representative Mm -hmm. of the country then the women should probably get more love and more attention too sure right and this year without the nhl there it got a lot less attention yeah certainly the cbc wasn't nearly as gung-ho about it as they have been in the past and so i wonder then if that's a sign that we that that the the preference that we have in this country is more localized to the professional teams and that when we have to then we go national in in canada i could see it to be to be honest the we don't have as big of a a rich as of a history as say some of the nations from europe and asia so and and we're also such a large country with such diverse backgrounds and ways of life i mean somebody that lives in a prairie town lives a very different life from somebody in vancouver or somebody up in a you know um the thing that unites us is that we're sort of canadian which is this kind of made up idea right yeah so maybe that's what it takes for every all of these sort of very very different people to come together under the banner you know and maybe maybe we just need to do it every four years just to kind of remember that we are all together maybe um well i guess it'd be every two years this happens during the summer too right like maybe not as much in the summer um i I don't think um in part because there's so many more events um plus we're not as good yeah canada's not nearly as good uh in the summer um but if if we do but th- there's another issue, and this came up. Uh, so at the Continental Cup of Curling, which we were at, mm-hmm. um, I had lunch with somebody from the Washington Post who was writing a story about the American teams, uh, the curling teams who were at the Continental Cup. And she was asking me about what curling means to this country. And we spent about an hour together. Uh, and she used one quote. And it was a quote that I was actually kind of gr- glad. She, like, she didn't pull something that stupid out mm-hmm. uh, of all the things I said. But w- the quote that she used for me is that... The, I think one of the reasons curling is popular is that we like to think that this is who we are, right? There's a congenial element to curling. It's a very social game. Mm -hmm. It's not really aggressive at all. Um, You try your best, um, but at the end of the game, you shake the other guy's hand or the girl's hand, and then you get a drink. Like, like that's, I I always say that that's like who this country wants to present itself as. That's one of the reasons the sport is so popular here. But one of the other things I said to her is that if we look at the sport right if you look at the the national championships the briars and the scotties the the participants they do a photo before every every event Mm -hmm. with all the teams lined up there if you look at them that does not look like the country that i live in Uh, and i walk around ottawa downtown ottawa every day Mm -hmm. Uh, visually that's not the country that i live in so then i wonder if when we hold up and certainly winter sports 
I think are like the winter sports are a lot more uh, homogenous yep. uh, than summer sports. So I wonder if we hold this up in this moment this, as this pinnacle of who we are as a country, and yet the people who are participating and representing the country don't necessarily re- represent everyone who's here, mm-hmm. then how can we actually claim any sort of identity from that? or any sort of authentic identity that isn't manufactured. That, I, you know, I do honestly wonder about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point that not everybody may feel included in, in looking at sort of the contingent that we send to any given Olympic Games. And to be honest, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to, to help other than maybe... maybe sending teams can inspire the next generation of young people watching we well, hope to so. say hey that i want to be that person there and we've seen the ad they have on that curling canada has for the young kids uh i want to be a firefighter i want to be whatever and yeah. the last kid wants to be a curler and uh there's a lot of uh, representation of all segments of canadian society in that commercial i'd say yeah and so is that curling canada selling us again on some sort of false idea that anybody can do it? I don't think so. I don't, I'm not that cynical. Well, no, certainly anyone can do it. Right. I mean, I, I've never been in a curling club um, and somebody's come in and been thrown out for uh, not being white. Like, I've never seen that happen. Of course not. Um, but, you know, I, I do wonder if, if we do a good enough job uh, reaching out to new Canadians, mm-hmm. say, or communities that that might not be exposed to curling for whatever reason whether it's um cultural background or or or, uh, economics income for sure it it can be an expensive sport to play as most winter sports are Mm -hmm. tend to be a lot more expensive to play uh winter sports and so maybe it's something to do do with that and and but that's where it gets to you know if we say that this is what this country is right and then these we have these winter sports that are homogenous does that mean that we have a breakdown almost between certain groups or, or, or people that that we aren't as together we weren't we, we don't have as much sort of continuity across the culture that one might think when we watch these sports yeah sure and and i mean like i said the the country is so big and and disparate groups of people that it, we can't all just come together because we're Canada. Um, I don't think that works. I think it takes celebrations like Canada day, like remembrance day, everybody coming together, you know, and the Olympics I think is one of those things that sort of serves to reinforce some sort of national identity. Uh, do we need to have a national identity? I mean, that's a bigger question that I'm certainly not smart enough to, (laughs) to answer. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, don't well know. let's well okay let's take it to uh, something else then that's in a similar vein because uh, it's something that I've never really been able to understand. And it, to me, it's stuck out. You mentioned Vancouver. I remember watching the uh, men's Olympic hockey final. Um, it was the Sunday afternoon, mm-hmm. I believe. I watched it by myself at home, and uh, Sidney Crosby scored the goal to win the game in overtime. And Chris Cuthbert's going crazy, losing his mind uh, on the call, and then. You know, about 15 minutes after, I, I heard through my window like how loud it was. So I went out in Elgin Street on in Ottawa here, which, if you don't know the city, um, every year where the uh, when they do the Remembrance Day ceremony uh, and the National War Memorial, that's at the head of Elgin Street. So basically, the street behind that that was full of people. <laughs> they had closed it down. It was full of people cheering. And I remember thinking to myself, why am I not more excited? Hmm. Like the fact that the Canadian team won didn't really instill any pride in me it, it didn't make a difference to me I the millionaire guys who were born in the same country that I was born in beat the millionaire guys who were born in a country that I was not born in that didn't make me necessarily want to jump around and, and cheer it didn't make me prideful of anything uh, and I know that's an extreme example because they're they're professionals but even when a Canadian who is an amateur wins Right, the Tessa virtue, uh, yeah, Tessa virtue, Scott Moyer, like mm-hmm. they're fun people. Uh, Scott Moyer drinking at the women's hockey game is the greatest meme of all time, I think. But the fact that they win, I mean, I don't, I didn't contribute to that. 
Um, but you did, Sean. I, I really, no, I literally did nothing to help them along the way. You're right. You don't pay taxes. So, uh, so yeah. So, but the idea of, of me sort of getting some sort of reflective pride or reflective glory off of that or, or that generating nationalism in me is a concept I've never truly been able to understand. How, how would you feel if we had a Winter Olympics and Canada sent no athletes at all? I would be disappointed from the perspective that I just wouldn't be able to watch. Well, sure, you would be able to watch. You just wouldn't be able to cheer for your okay. Let me Canadian okay. Athletes. Let me let me rephrase. Um, I, I I would probably still watch. Um, I think the coverage would be a lot different. Obviously, <laughs> the CBC. Um, the only time maybe I would notice is in curling, and one of the reasons I like watching the Canadian teams is that I know them. Mm-hmm. But when it's a sport say short i like watching short track speed skating regardless of who's in it i watched the long track mass start like that was crazy uh and super fun and like i think i would still watch um the the sports that i don't normally watch that i only watch during the olympics regardless if there was a canadian there because a lot of the sports that i only watch during the olympics are sports that canada's not particularly good at Mm -hmm. uh, or metal threats at Mm -hmm. at least so like I, i don't know if it would yeah i i think that you know i there's a reason that i don't watch these sports and the reason is not because canada's not good at it you know the reason i don't watch cross-country skiing is because i think it's kind of boring to watch a 50 kilometer cross-country skiing race on tv (laughs) i mean i watch curling yes because canada's good at it but also because i like curling i i play maybe i play because canada's good at it maybe canada's good at it because i play Yes, Whoa. because you play. Well, no, because because like it's people, got the infrastructure. There's right? a lot of people who play. So yeah. so I mean, using it as a as an example to a rallying point for national identity, I think is reasonable. Okay, so you were in the building when Kevin Martin won yeah. in 2010, and they had to stop. They didn't have to stop, but the team chose to stop because the crowd started singing the national anthem. Mm-hmm. What do you remember? What you were feeling? Yeah, in it, that moment. it's like a sort of, I was, I was pretty critical of the crowd in Vancouver for yelling when they weren't supposed to. It was, a, it wasn't a very good curling crowd through the week. No, it was a good crowd, but not, not, not a good curling, curling crowd. crowd. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember thinking, uh, Hey guys, like shut up so he can <laughs> throw, but, but the feeling when they win and everybody's sort of in it together, everybody's excited. That's that's a, an amazing feeling and that's something I'll never forget you know even when Cheryl Bernard lost and I was there it was still like a great atmosphere for for an event and it was just so cool and why it ended up that way I don't I don't know I mean right but but this is where I, I wondered too if it's not necessarily the, the nationalistic idea it's that because they're Canada it's that in that case and certainly with every curling team that we've sent for you and me mm-hmm. Like we've we've watched them for a long time, with the possible exception of Mike Harris, who seemed to come out of nowhere, and and win in nineteen ninety eight. But they're teams we knew them, mm-hmm. um, if not personally, but like you, you see, see them, them on TV. a lot, right? You see them go through national championships and uh, world championships mm-hmm. and and all the events that get them to that point. So you know their story, you know who they are. Mm-hmm. Whereas the sports that we don't watch, we look up like, oh, this person's representing Canada. Maybe there's not the same connection with the individual. The bobsledders. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Right. And yeah. this isn't to diminish what they do, of course, because mm-hmm. to be an Olympian takes a tremendous amount of work or a tremendous amount of intellect, as the Hungarian um, ski, uh, ski half pipe woman uh, proved, which is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in an Olympics. And if you don't know the story, just Google um, Hungarian half pipe skier. Uh, and I'm sure it will come up. So basically, this woman made the Olympics just by a, basically a loophole in the rules. But these people who who you know put in the same amount of work as everyone else, but I I don't know them. I don't I, I don't follow their stories. Maybe it's a, a problem with the media too. And certainly Doug Smith and the Toronto Star writes about this all the time that we should give more attention to amateur athletes outside of the Olympic cycle, so that when we get to the Olympic cycle we actually know who they are and we don't have to have these five minute profiles before every event because we already know who these people are but 
I, I wonder if the connection that you would have then in, in 2010 and that em- emotional feeling you have is because you know the people a little bit and not necessarily because of what was on their back. Yeah, and it could be. And it could be the reason that the hockey has been the biggest event at the Olympics is because in general you know who the players are, mm-hmm. right? And so for me, knowing who the curlers are, that's what I connect with. And the reason that the, I think the reason that these other sports don't get as much coverage, right, is because it doesn't sell newspapers. It doesn't have, have people turn their TVs on to right. watch, you know. And so, in that sense, it is some sort of media, corporate uh, entity that's that's creating the situation where we don't know all the players. Right. Okay. So let's you you bring that up. This I want to talk about this as well because when we talk about the the manufacturing or the, the, the making money off of nationalism. I think the IOC, um, this is obviously what they peddle in. Mm-hmm. FIFA does the exact same thing. And we have seen that the IOC and FIFA are incredibly corrupt organizations. Mm-hmm. They claim to be altruistic and all about the athletes and the promotion of the sport. And then story after story about bribes and taking money out and being really exploitative of places the IOC has been very exploitative of places not really caring about what happens to venues after or what happens to the economy of the place after Um, and we saw that a lot in Brazil so this is something else that to me kind of tempers the whole thing right we have because it has nothing to do with the athletes right the athletes are the athletes they're doing their thing Mm -hmm. they you know train for four years for the the moment to be at this the, the pinnacle of their career but that's all set against the backdrop of these slimy executives uh, who are trying to take advantage of that emotional connection that people can have to the athletes because they're representing the country to line their own pockets uh, and that to me it, it's hard when I watch the Olympics to separate those two things I mean, yeah, every organization that gets big enough is going to have some sort of corruption, right? And what you hope to be able to do is to weed it out uh, as much as possible, mm. right? So, th- I, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say about, like... Does it bother, but the idea of them manufacturing these nationalistic moments that you are supposed to feel national pride and therefore that either justifies or gets you to overlook some of these negatives that go on but i think like governments do that too governments oh yeah governments uh, do it all the time and it's a horrible thing that they do matthew hayday wrote about a whole book a whole book about it well not just about this but a, a, a lot about how celebrations and commemorations are designed specifically to promote a specific agenda and right. a specific ideology and so if we look at the olympic games right what was that originally intended to do was that intended to pit one city in Greece against another city in Greece? Was it intended just to celebrate sport? Uh, I'd argue like what it's become is a little bit nation against nation, but I think in the end it's still more of a celebration of sport than it is a USA against China against Canada, you know, that to me, that's what I think it is. Okay, so then the, and I guess another example would be the NCAA. So I was listening, it's Mm -hmm. March Madness, and I was listening to a podcast coming over here, and one of the people said that one of the reasons they like the NCAA is the idea that this is, for a lot of the kids playing, sort of the only chance that they get, and they're not getting paid, mm-hmm. um, and that makes it good. Whereas if you took a league of these the kids who are good enough to play in the NBA, who will be good enough to play in the NBA, basically put them in the minor leagues, um, that that wouldn't be as good, that wouldn't be as much fun, because then they're getting paid and they're not doing it for the right reasons. And I'm sitting there thinking that that argument makes no sense to me um, mm-hmm. because if you were to so say go to a college theater production you wouldn't say oh this is so much better because they're doing it uh, and they're not getting paid they're, they're just giving it their all like sport is the only place where this sort of mentality exists right. where the love of the game is supposed to trump like negative things that go along with it and that we're supposed to believe that, that sport and those who participate in it um, even if there's stuff negative behind the scenes or if, if the IOC or FIFA or the NCAA are getting rich off what some could say are exploitative practices, the, the sport itself is pure and we have to appreciate it just for that. But it, to me, it's the only avenue in which that would be acceptable. 
I, I guess I understand what you mean, but uh, to me, it's not. It, it doesn't change what's going on on the field of play. Uh huh. You know, so it, so when I watch, you know, the curling, I'm I'm watching for the athletes playing, and I'm not really thinking about, oh boy, they're gonna tear this rink down in two weeks because nobody's ever gonna use it again. Isn't that a problem though? That sports a lot that we allow sports to do that the, the the national like especially with the olympics that we say well we're doing this nationalistic thing uh, or bringing the world community together whatever it is um with really no tangible benefit to it uh or in, in some cases a, something that is negative for the people who host it for sure and I, I think we're seeing that play out with the lack of bids going on for different events you know for the we're, we're going to see three olympics in a row in asia uh, two of them in, uh, well, one of them in China in a more authoritarian regime. Uh, we saw Russia also yeah. hosting a little bit more of an author- authoritarian regime. And in this case, you know, they've got a more centralized power to be able to to say, hey, we'll build whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen it with uh, World Cups. Uh, we've seen it all over the place. So, mm-hmm. So I think what's happening is that people are realizing it around the world and are stopping to bid on these kind of events so are we going to see the end of the olympics you know to be honest like maybe but but what's good is that like i think the olympics in vancouver were overall good for canada and good for the city Mm -hmm. um all the events uh, the event spaces are in use now uh they're being being used the place where the athletes village was my friends live there now like it's really revitalized the waterfront i think overall it was good for the country the the train from the airport is another thing where where it fails to us to see us is like something in like what happened with the world cup in brazil yeah. where they built a stadium in the jungle in the middle of nowhere and now it's just overgrown right yeah. it, it's not uh not the way to do it no and we saw we saw it too with uh there's there's great websites devoted to abandoned sports stadium, mm-hmm. right? And and these venues or Olympic venues that don't get used anymore. And uh, so if you're hearing this, a game just ended, which is why it got a little louder in here. Um, but one of the things that sort of bugs me about that is that maybe it's a maybe it's an allegory for just our life in general that we allow ourselves to ignore and have this cognitive dissonance for negative things um, if there's a small aspect of it that's positive and or that makes us feel good sure and and maybe what's happening is that with fewer people being interested in it maybe then the powers that be will have to say hey listen if we're going to actually make this work we've got to clean up our act and and give people a reason to want to host these kind of things. Right. So, so let's just sort of try and summarize a bit uh, as we wrap this up. So, I'm I'm of the feeling that nationalism through sport. I'm skeptical of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think nationalism or, or national identity should come through other avenues primarily uh, than sport. But I understand why people use sport as an avenue to rally around. Sure. Uh, and sort of proclaim some form of, of nationalism. Uh, I just don't like when it's sold, like when it's used to sell stuff. Uh, I find that problematic. And when it's used for what, in some cases, are nefarious purposes. And that's what I think the IOC and FIFA have done. I think they've used nationalism and people's love for sport for nefarious purposes. Uh, and I find that problematic. So I think that we would stand to benefit if we were a little more critical or skeptical uh, when we approach sports. And we didn't accept at the face of things this altruistic interpretation that these organizations put forth that's a fair point and I, and I think what we need to do then is rely on the media to to help inform us before these kind of events or like inform us all the time about things that are going on and try to not uh, not have the media outlets be the ones that are feeding us right yeah the, we need to demand more from the press to, yeah. to, to so that we can be fully informed about these things and maybe it's on us too as citizens to 
Well, sure, but we need so we need like equal coverage of yes, the greatness of the athletes, but also hey, the problems that are going on with building costs in right. this uh, country, or right. it just make sure that both sides of the story are being told. Right, or even like in a place like Qatar, which is having the the World Cup uh, in a few years, the mm-hmm. amount of people who have died building those venues, yeah. like these type of stories, need to have coverage during during the event they need to have coverage yes. they can't be sort of parallel yeah. coverages uh, from different outlets you know? right which again was is one of the things that happened during the olympics a lot with uh, i think the sean white case was really interesting that nbc mm-hmm. didn't cover uh the the lawsuit and the settlement that he had yeah they um, they sort of said nbc news that's an nbc news thing to cover right. so it's they didn't sports. mention it on the sports side yeah but it's all intertwined. So. It is, yeah. And so, yeah, there needs to be a little better job. And, yeah, the, the, the companies that would be covering this, in the North American case, the CBC and uh, NBC, we need to be sure that we demand from them that, that they're not going easy on the companies that they would technically be in partnership with. Yeah, yeah, that and I think we need to demand that of the press all the time. Yeah, there needs to be a little more journalistic integrity in this regard. Absolutely. All right, so um, so that's our little discussion about nationalism, sports, and all that. Uh, I think it was good to, to talk about this in this time because the Olympics always bring these things, things out. And if you like that discussion, you can join us on the Game of Stones podcast. We have a little more fun over on the Game of Stones podcast, John. We don't talk about corruption in... We don't. We talk just about curling. If you like curling... <laughs> Um, and all the things that go along with curling, the drama, the behind the scenes stuff, the who wins, who loses, all that team stuff. shakeups. Yeah. That's what we talk about on the game of stones oh podcast. So you can find, uh, find that it's uh, on Twitter at game of stones pod. Just search game of stones, um, on Apple podcast, Google play, wherever it is you get your podcast, you can find it. Um, so Scott, thank you for this. Hey, man, no problem. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, uh, History Slam on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us there. And if you haven't yet, we also have a new feed from Active History. It's called History Chats. Scott, have you subscribed to the History Chats? Oh, yeah. So the History Chats new. We've had two episodes up so far. It's a feed dedicated to talks that we have. Uh, so we're starting our run with a bunch from the other 60s symposium that the University of Toronto ran last spring, all about Canada 150. And once we run through those, we're gonna go back into our catalog and, and post some of the great talks that we have at Active History. So please do subscribe, just History Chats, you can find it there. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for the podcast, History Slam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out, and you see Enrico Palazzo. Please say hi for him. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes. <laughs>